coming up on this episode. Are there opportunities in real estate and how can we take advantage of those opportunities? You cannot paint property or real estate with one broad brush. Given the current economic environment that we've been in, you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic, what asset classes within real estate would you recommend for people to consider investing in? There are only two types of property. This bubble in real estate in mm -hmm. Kenya, mm -hmm. uh, is it going to burst? Has mm -hmm. it already burst? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you must make a decision of what you want to be and stay focused on that line. You know your goals in finance, we call it the investment policy statement. Eight out of 10 Kenyans are retiring poor. Hey there, did you know that according to the Retirement Benefits Authority in Kenya, eight out of 10 Kenyans are retiring poor, unable to sustain their current standard of living before retirement. Like, that's 80%, guys. That is huge. That's the majority of us. And that's why we are here. Welcome to the Isifa Investment Show, where we showcase investment products that you can invest in so that you can save and plan for your retirement and your future and live a comfortable retirement. We also showcase professionals who you can reach out to and get advice from. People who are, you know, certified and regulated by the regulators that exist. My name is Rena Hicks and I am your host today. I am the Director of Operations at FIDA Investment Bank and I like to call myself a personal finance enthusiast. Now, we talked about asset classes and the different asset classes that exist. In case this is the first time you're watching this show, um, an asset class is really just a grouping of different assets. So guys, we have five asset classes. I think we looked at this in a previous episode. And those five asset classes are really just the grouping of assets in different groups, right? So because they have similar characteristics and they have similar laws that govern them. Okay, so we have cash and cash-like assets. We have fixed income investments. We have equities or stocks or shares. We have um, real estate and then everything else that doesn't fall under those are alternative investments. Now, today we are looking at real estate investments and so that we can see how can we invest in real estate? Are there opportunities in real estate and how can we take advantage of those opportunities? I am joined by David Luigi, who's been in the industry for over 15 years. And David Luigi is the CEO of Batian Fund. And this, this fund is actually 100% owned by Gen Africa. And Luigi, welcome, David. Thank welcome. you, Rina. Thank you. Karibu sana. We're so happy to have you on the show. My pleasure to, to be here. So as we start, maybe you can just begin by telling us a little bit about yourself. Okay. Thank you. Thank you to Isifa. Uh, welcome, viewers. My name is David Wafula Luigi. I am a trained land economist registered as a value by the Values Registration Board and a full member of the Institution of Surveyors of Kenya. I have practiced real estate as a value property manager, estate agent for about seven or eight years. Then I crossed over into the finance industry where I did some certification programs and was thereby registered by the Institute of Certified uh, Investment and Financial Analysts, which is ECFA. I have then been with Genesis Kenya Investment Management Limited, now rebranded to Gen Africa Asset Managers. I have been with them for about seven or eight years now, and our primary mandate is the management of pension funds and other institutional investors. And as you've rightly said, there are various asset classes, so all our institutional investors do invest in many of these asset classes, including real estate. So my role in Gen Africa is to take care of all of the investments in real estate. Mm, Thank you. That's awesome. Now, one of the things that was surprising for me to learn, which I learned in the last two years, is the fact that there's different asset classes within real estate, and you call them market segments. And I'm just like, wow. <laughs> and you said there are 35. What did you say? 36, 36. of them. So there's all these different, you know, segments that you can invest in within yes. real estate. Yes. Maybe you can just tell us a little bit about what those are. And my second question that goes along with that is, 
given the current economic environment that we've been in, you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic, the economy is not doing too well. Um, we were moving into a recession. Hopefully, you know, we'll come out of it sooner that, rather than later. What segments of those um, or what asset classes within real estate would you recommend for people to consider investing in? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Rina. We have realized when we were looking at opportunities for investment for our clients, most of those special funds for whom we manage the investments, that you cannot paint property or real estate with one broad brush. Therefore, I'll simplify it for all of us in a manner of categorizing these market segments. So if we can remember when we were in standard six, we were being told what are the three essential needs of a human being, mm -hmm. food, shelter, clothing. So the first point everyone should understand is that real estate just provides shelter. So if property or land is not providing shelter, mm -hmm. it serves no purpose. So maybe the natural question would be shelter for what? So this is the first point of consideration when you're dividing real estate markets. There are only two types of property. It's either commercial property, so this building or land is providing shelter to commercial activity, or residential property. There is no third type of property. So step number one, when you're deciding which market segment to go into, understand what do you want to provide shelter for? Commerce or people mm. who have gone home to rest? Once you've decided that, then you need to understand what kind of shelter are you going to be providing? Are you going to be providing uh, this shelter for people who want to own and therefore you're building for sale, or you want to own it yourself and keep leasing or renting it to them. So we call that market segment by business model. So you can have two commercial properties, but the commercial property for sale is very different from the commercial property for rent. So now we know commercial and residential property, market segmentation by property type, and now we also know by business model. Are we doing it for sale or for rent? Right. Then the third thing we need to choose is how close are we going mm. to the center of commerce? You remember we said there is commercial property and residential Residential. property. Mm. So anytime you are looking at the center of economic activity, you're talking of a city center or a town center. When you have high demand of commercial activity because you are at the center of the games, then you know that there you are dealing with commercial, uh, or we call it in technical terms the urban core. We call it the commercial uh, hub. When you go a bit further, mm -hmm. so if I could use the Nairobi example, the CBD, Central Business District, would be the commercial hub. Then when you get out for a bit, maybe five to 10 kilometers, you have what we call the suburbs. The demand there is not so much for the commercial property, but more for the residential property. And so the suburbs in Nairobi's example would be things like Pilimani, Athi River, Upper Hill, Kangemi, Westlands. The property market segment of that side of town would be different from the city center. Mm. Then finally you have the hinterland or the rural property. And this is now when you go to places as far as, in again, the example of Nairobi, Rironi, uh, if you go down to Isinya, Kajiado, they all are trying to tap their demand from the commercial activity that is centrally located in Nairobi but the needs they will be serving are different. So once you know by property type what market segment, commercial versus residential, by commercial um, uh, proximity to the uh, center of activities, whether it is the city center, the suburbs, or uh, the hinterland. Thirdly, once you know whether you want to do it for sale or rent, then now you also have to decide mm -hmm. what segment of the population you want to address. So you will have the high-end property by income level, 
the middle income property, still by income level, and the low cost property. So in the example of Nairobi again, you have the high end, your I&M bank tower, you have your middle income, you talk of Kimathi House, Nanak House, or the low cost, Nyamakema River Road. So once you have those four parameters, property type, commercial residential, the business model, uh, renting or, renting or selling, selling, the income segment, high, middle, or low, and finally proximity to the center of economic activity, then now I can go to answer, in this current environment, mm -hmm. where is the money? So we've seen that in terms of by property type, when there was lockdown, everyone was told to shut their business, stay at home. So already, demand for commercial property down, yeah. demand for residential property up. People's incomes have been hit. Mm. So by market segment, the higher you are on the market segment, the lesser demand you have. Because if you had a high flying job, now suddenly you can only afford mm. the properties down the market segment. Therefore, the people in the middle income and low cost housing are the ones who are in the money. Those who are focused at the higher end of the pyramid have suffered in the current environment. If it was by business model, is it rent or sales? Just like we started with our standard six uh, uh, business education, food, shelter, clothing. Right. If you cannot afford, because incomes have been decimated by COVID, if you cannot afford to own your home, you still must have shelter. Right. Therefore, you'll want to rent. You'll default to renting. So if you are in the business of selling property, you've taken a hit. Yeah. Because people are now defaulting to rent. to rent. And then if you look at by proximity to commercial activity, once the lockdowns happened and the businesses were being shut down, therefore you find that most people were retreating to their homes, which are typically not in the city center, but in the suburbs and in the rurals. So properties that are in the city center, and especially because COVID does not want any social gatherings or congest uh, congesting of people, you'll find that the centers, town centers, city centers, are being kept away from. And therefore, you find that people who are having properties in uh, the suburbs and the peripheries, mm -hmm. the rurals, are better uh, placed. And that is why you'll see that now instead of people going to shop in a big mall, you'll find a small retail center in a petrol station. And if you come to Nairobi, you'll find that those are mushrooming all over the place because it's smaller, so not too much crowding mm. if you're thinking of COVID. And that is why when you find the same developer who owns a mall is choosing to go into these small peripherals, that is how I would segment property markets and see where the opportunity lies. With that, with this, with that you know, fantastic summary that you've given us about the different segments, about the different opportunities and the impact that COVID has had and where people have made money. Um, something we've been talking about for a long time is this bubble in real estate in mm -hmm. Kenya. Mm -hmm. uh, is it going to burst? Has mm -hmm. it already burst? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, what's happening there? You know, mm -hmm. are we going to see a decline in, 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 um, mm -hmm. in pricing, mm -hmm. in rents? Mm -hmm. what's, what's your view? Okay. So it's good that we started by breaking down real estate markets using the four criteria. And when we are looking at the bubble, we again said that as with any normal market activity in real estate, you cannot uh, track the activity of one market segment with the happenings in another market segment. Yeah. So with respect to a bubble, I'll again default back to my market segments and ask, what is a bubble? I'll quickly respond and say, this is when the price, and notice I'm differentiating the word price from value, a bubble is when the price is unjustifiably higher than the value mm. of the property. What do I mean by price? When you go to a market, there are two market forces that determine the price. First is the value. Then secondly is the market sentiment. We are human beings. How God made us is we don't think with our heads. Surprise, surprise, we think with our hearts. We are emotional beings. So you'll find that when somebody 
knows that the rent this property will give me, if I was to value it to today's value, I will be able to pay, let's say, 10 million shillings. But because it is the only one left, and my fellow competitor wants to buy it at 11 million, I'll close my eyes and buy it at 12 million. What explains the 2 million? Market sentiment. So when this fat is built on top of value to arrive at the overpricing of an asset, when this fat becomes in excess, that is a bubble waiting and, to burst. And who defines what the excess is? Typically, it's transactions in the market. And transactions are driven by two people primarily. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the participants in any contract, the buyer and the seller, and two, my fellow professionals, the property value. Because these seller agreements are predicated on valuation reports. And so when you are doing valuations, now I can go to my professional colleagues, there are three ways in which you can value a property. By market comparable, that I can sell this one at 12 million because the similar one next to it was also sold at 12 million. You can do a discounted cash flow where you project all the revenue that you will get and present value it to today. And the third way is, if I was to build this exact same unit today at today's prices, what we call the replacement cost yeah. or contractor's approach, how much would it cost me? So as valuers, we need to advise the first two, the counterparts in a contract, that the best way yeah. to ensure that you don't overprice this property is using the discounted cash flow with very um, uh, prudent assumptions. Assumptions as to forward inflation outlook, assumptions as to um, the three main variables in property, what will be the rent escalation like, what will be the occupancy be like, mm -hmm. and how much operating expenses will eat into those incomes. Once you've locked those in, then you'll avoid overpricing. Yeah. Now, once a bubble is determined to be unjustified fat in the price, come to Kenya and ask ourselves, where is it that we think properties are unjustifiably overpriced? Back to basic economics. When you're told that oversupply will lead to a crash in prices and high demand will lead to an increase nice. in prices. Mm. But if you have very little price, uh, supply, then the price will go up. Let's look at the Kenyan example. How much supply of well-serviced land do we have? And well-serviced land, I mean, you have a good road to access your property, you have good water supply, you don't have to bring low water by lorries, you have good connectivity to electricity, and you have good sewage or foul drainage systems. And in a COVID era, I would dare say data, fiber, internet, is now one of those critical services that need to be available in a property. Mm. How many properties have good supply of these services? And therefore, if we have very little land that is well serviced, isn't it justifiable that then the prices are extremely high? So I wouldn't say that they are unjustifiably overvalued. They are fundamentally few in supply because we all know that if you go to Siokimao, you'll already knock half my list out. Mm. You'll not get home fiber, you'll not get proper sewage, and the roads are atrocious. Therefore, fundamentally, prices are well justified in that valuation. However, not to say that there are not market segments where, especially after the Kibaki years, where there was this boom in economic development, that people started speculating that because once you build it, they will come mm. because there was so much demand and the regime prior to Kibaki had depressed the economy so much that when Kibaki liberalized the economy, even if you overvalued property or overpriced property, then people would buy. Therefore, what we have seen is once the economic growth slowed down, people were unwilling 
to get rid of this overpricing they had already locked in because they had already seen profits which they, do no, long, they no longer want to give up. What I think is happening is not a burst of a bubble. Mm -hmm. What I think is a correction of prices to get rid of the fat in overpricing and people are now coming back to, de to, to realize that I would rather not overpay for a property because there is no longer competition that if I don't buy it, mm. somebody else will buy it. Because there has been a slowdown in economic growth, there is now much more property available, so the supply is more, and therefore that competition that makes people overpay so that they get some uh, uh, bit of it is no longer there. So a bursting of a bubble is where once you especially buy a lot of the properties in the economy, in a leveraged manner, using too much debt, mm -hmm. then there is a mass default like what we can see in China. Mm. Then there is a systemic risk that once all this property comes back to the market, oversupply, yeah. prices crash. But look at Kenya. We see auctions happening every day. Are they selling? No. Because the law is protective of the price. It has set a floor that beyond 70-75%, you cannot sell. Mm. It will become illegal. Therefore, there are no takers. So there is no more pressure on the defaulters to be able to liquidate. Or even on the banks, they are just not able to liquidate. And much more so, most of the property in Kenya is financed with cash, equity. Equity is patient. You do not have to distress it. I can sit and wait for the next 10 years. We can see where we are seated here in Upper Hill. There are many buildings which have remained uh, vacant, yeah. but because they belong to long-term uh, capital players, they're happy to wait. They're happy to wait. There's a property on 4th Ngong Avenue that has remained vacant for almost five years. They're happy to wait. So if you do not have that distress and mass default, there is no event where mass property is coming back to the market. And therefore, there isn't going to be any trigger for a crash in prices. Interesting. Yeah. So what I hear you saying is that it's a correction. It's a correction. And because there's, there's the purchases of those um, properties was not done using high, a lot of debt, then there's no pressure to sell, and so therefore we'll not see a huge decline in prices. And even where there's pressure to sell, our yeah. debt to loan, rev, uh, our debt to value ratios are usually not aggressive. 60-70%, most banks, rule of thumb, that's yeah, what they that's give. What they You'll not find, even for these ones who are talking of 1 or 5% right. mortgage, yeah. even if you could take all of them and throw them back into the market, the market demand is so high that even that supply, if it comes, the market will just use up all of it without the prices blipping. So, so then briefly, for somebody who's thinking, okay, sounds great, sounds great, David, I want to invest. What are some of the key considerations, in summary, that they should take? Um... For anybody who wants to invest, whether individually or in a group, there are four steps to the real estate investment process. And just like with anything in life, if you do not know what you want, how will you get it? How will you know when you've got it? So the first step, if I could use some technical term, is to know your goals. In finance, we call it the investment policy statement. Mm. And in real estate, we call it the PASIS, the Property Asset Class Investment Strategy. Define what you want. And when I say define what you want, in defining your goals, you need to have about eight parameters which you need to define. I'll not go through them, but I'll list the three basic ones. Know what kind of risk you can tolerate. How much money can you lose? That will determine whether you go into construction or you buy a ready property. Number two, determine what kind of return objective you want. Remember we said you can either go for sales or rentals. Mm. If you're going for sales, you're not getting rent, you're getting capital gains. If you're going for rentals, you're not getting capital gains, you're getting cash inflows. Determine which one you want. Are you trying to grow your assets or are you trying to generate cash flows? And thirdly, know your time horizon. If you look at two rivers, they started that project in 2010. 11 years later, it's still a construction site because 
they know it's within their time horizon. But if you have five years to retire, you only have five years within which to realize your investment. Go for a smaller scale of project. There are seven others which you could actually articulate, but those are the three core. Okay. Once you know what you want, now go to the next step. Know how to get there. So with respect to real estate, we call it market research and feasibility study. To demystify that, I'd simply break it down again to a SWOT analysis. Go to the market, look for opportunities and threats that meet your goals and objectives. And then rank order them in terms of their strengths and weaknesses on two parameters. How well they propagate your goals and objectives and two, how well they ride the market cycle, the property market cycles, the opportunities while avoiding the threats. Once you've done that, do due diligence on those ones which you've selected, then you go to the third step, execute. When I say execute, be very careful on three items. One, know how to time your market. This is the wrong time to go into the sales market for any asset uh, market segment like we've discussed previously. Yeah. But it is the right time to go into rental because people can't afford to buy, they're defaulting to rent. So time your market segments well. Know the market cycles in each of those market segments. Time your development cycle well. When I say development cycle or asset life cycle, know whether based on your goals and objectives, you want to go into an asset early when it is mature or when it is in decline so that you redevelop it. That is a um, detail which you need to also articulate with your financial advisor or investment analyst. Then once you have executed your project, you have to marry its output with your original goals. There are three levels to property investment management. People only know the day-to-day -day operations, otherwise referred to as property management. They forget the other two hierarchies, property asset management and property investment management. What is the difference? Property management is just the day-to-day -day operations, does nothing to do with your strategy for the property. What do I mean? There are two properties which will be sitting side by side, but one is earning 50% more rent than the other and spending 30% less costs than the other. What's the difference? The asset manager will be able to tell you. Then finally, property investment management. If the returns on your property investment are giving you returns less than a bond or a business you'll have done or something else, one of the other asset classes, why is it not competing well to either match or beat the other asset classes? That's the role of the investment manager. So don't focus on the operations and forget the asset manager and investment manager's role to ensure now the property delivers to your original investment mm. objectives. Wow, thank you, David. Caribou. Hey, we were in class. I hope you didn't miss that. <laughs> if you, if uh, this one will need you to just go back and watch again, please share this video with those of you who are in your life. So we are now moving into the segment that is Ask Your FA. David is a member of ISIFA and he's here to listen to your questions. In case you haven't asked a question, you know, David's comments have brought a question, please, um, write to us. Our share, um, social media handles are uh, there on the screen. We have a question from Kevin, and Kevin is asking, uh, we formed a group last year where we, sometime in July or something, uh, about a year or so ago, where we deposit 500 shillings every month. Currently, we have over 300,000 shillings in our account. Our long-term plan is buying plots and building houses as a group. How can we actualize our dream? What would you tell Kevin? Ah, thank you. That's a very good question. I wish I had access to Kevin. Before I answer his question, I would have a few of my own. For example, with respect to time horizon, how soon do they want to build these houses? In terms of return objective, what type of houses? To live in or to rent out? In terms of risk tolerance, how many are they in the group? How old are they? Are they all? aligned. But anyway, since I don't have access to Kevin, I'll give him two steps. One, COVID has shown us that you need not travel to Nairobi 
from wherever you are. Because I would also have wanted to ask Kevin, is he in Mombasa, Kitale, yeah. Meru? Because property market segments differ by geographical location. But since COVID has taught us that we need not be physically in one place for us to consult, my first of the two steps would be he needs to consult an ECFA registered financial advisor so that, like we said, if he does not know what he wants, you've seen he said what he thinks he wants, mm. but I have many more questions because he needs to flesh out the entire policy or the entire goals and objectives as the real estate investment would require. So he needs to join to contact ISIFA so that he links up with an ISIFA registered financial advisor to be able to flesh out for him his group's entire property asset class investment strategy. Like I said, there are eight items. He needs to define exactly what they want for all these eight items. And if he's a Christian, he can go to the book of uh, Amos, and Jesus told him, how can two people work together unless they agree. they're agreed? <laughs> so that now he shares that strategy paper with his group, and they agree mm -hmm. that, yes, we agree to all these eight items, and this is what we want. Step number two, don't try to do it by yourself. Mm -hmm. Get developers who have done this before. We saw in Kisaju, Jamie Bora Bank helped the ladies to come up with their own estate. Not the ladies who are trying to run around with architects, engineers, and the rest, no. We at Gen Africa, for institutional investors, have put together the Batian Property Fund so that the trustees of these pension boards do not need to start looking at architectural drawings and things like that. Kevin and any other investor should then partner with somebody who will be able to deliver on those terms of reference as defined by their goals and objectives. And I believe once he's gotten in touch with the financial advisor, the financial advisor, after looking at their goals and objectives or the investment policy statement, but in this case, since it's a property investment, a property asset class investment strategy, with that in hand, then it will be easy for the financial advisor to then marry them to the investment product or provider will be able to help them deliver on that dream that, that they have. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. There you have it, Kevin. Next, guys, we are going into Know Your FA, where we learn more about those who've gone before us, who've been in the industry 30 years and more, founders of this institution that we call ISIFA, people who have had and played a huge role in seeing the financial industry in Kenya grow. Here we go. Welcome to the Know Your FFA segment where we get inspired by renowned fellows and members of ISIFA who have made a mark in the investment and finance industry. I'm FA Diana Moriuki Maina, the CEO of ISIFA, and today we are joined by a distinguished fellow of ISIFA who is very passionate and has made significant contribution to the growth of ISIFA as well as the profession. And that is none other than FFA Dr. George Walker, who was also the third chairman of ISIFA. There's that question FFA Nguru asked you, what is your vision of ISIFA? What do you feel is the impact ISIFA has, uh, especially in the economic development of the country as a whole? I look back to times when I had a personal experience. I started investing in the stock market about when I was in the second year. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> one time, one of the stockbrokers was involved in some corporate governance issues. And uh, to cut the long story short, we lost our investments in one way or another. So when I, I would look at ISIF and I would wonder, okay, so w that propelled me to think that the institute has a role you remember there's a time in, 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 in this country where people who served in the stock market, either as investment and especially client-facing uh, persons, had some integrity issues. Mm -hmm. yeah? 
and I always had a, 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 a vision that if we have these people, the way lawyers, accountants, and all other serious professions like medicine have, if we had an institute where people can be reported to, then people will start listening more to their professional call as opposed to the get-rich-quick schemes that is typical of Kenyans. And therefore, when I looked back, I said this might be an opportunity. And therefore, for me, my passion with the CIFA is to not only just be a member, but also to help protect the many millions of investors in the country who commit and entrust their resources with uh, investment banks and stockbrokers, and especially the client facing. You will be shocked that at one point, I don't know whether I was being reckless or over trusting. There's this investment broker, I, a client uh, facing investment brokerage stuff, who, because of I was busy, came to ask me, came and gave me a proposal that there are some good stocks be going around and you have not been investing for long. And I thought, wow, this is very good keeping tabs with me. So I said, the rule was always pay your money through the bank. But because we had dealt for long, I gave the money. Later on, I ran into trouble. I was called and told, you had bought stocks and you did not pay. And I felt, this gentleman, why was he doing such a thing? But out of that, I learned a lot of lessons that, you know, if there was an institute to report the gentleman to, and the gentleman would not be in good standing, at least they would look back and say, we need to, we need to work in a certain way, a professional way, as opposed to just doing a typical thing that any other person would do because they are not professionals. Yeah, I don't believe, for example, that uh, someone would wake up and uh, eat someone's, to, for lack of a better word, eat someone's investment and sweat because you are in a, a position where someone has entrusted resources. So that, that's my vision, that this institute must help grow professionals of greater um, impact, not only to Kenya, but to this continent. Because I see ourselves should have the vision to expand into areas and countries with no professionals in the area of investment and finance and grow our brand and help the institute to grow that area. The second bit of my vision is many people grapple with wealth creation. And uh, we sit at a point where we could do a lot to help people grow their wealth. Because many people come through um, money, either earned through sweat or through charities or whatever. But then if you watch them many years later, it's hard to, to show what they have done with their money. And some of them even suffer financial insecurity. And yet financial security is one of our forte as the institute. So that's, that's my vision for the institute. And finally, Kenya grappling with a lot of debt issues. Mm -hmm. And debt goes to financing. And unfortunately, our professionals have helped the sector in the, in the private sector grow well, but not done the same for government. Mm -hmm. So I hope and trust that as we go forward, we would integrate most of our professionals in the debt and financing scenario so that our country do not have a heavy debt uh, portfolio that we have without much value addition, because debt is good as long as we invest it well. And I think that's what our professionals will play. If you mention the likes of Warren Buffett, mm -hmm. if you mention in our local scenes, I don't want to mention names for fear of being controversial. But if you look at them, they draw a lot of their business, sorry, a lot of their impact from the investment sector. So one, I want to tell the professionals, you are in the right track. Because this profession helps you as an individual to grow your own financial security while at the same time gives you an opportunity for employment and all those kind of things. So that's one. Number two, as a professional, you need to know that you need to be focused. 
you must make a decision of what you want to be and stay focused on that line. Many professionals start off very well, but they are along the line, they miss their professional uh, attention because probably some quick money comes your way or some challenges come your way and it becomes very hard for you to stay on the course. So if they choose to run, they should run the long haul and they should have the vision in mind of either one day becoming business uh, professionals like consultants or businessmen or themselves getting employment and they should see that vision from the beginning so they stay focused on the course. Because along the line you'll get derailing, you'll say, why don't you try this profession? But you stay on the course. Then the other is, of course, just to be consistent. Study hard, pass your exams, join the institute at the conclusion of it, uh, adhere to the rules and regulations of the institute, and of course, continuously attend your continuous professional development to give you new dimensions. For example, on a personal note, I was grappling with this issue of bitcoins and where, where is the whole cryptocurrency thing. Until I attended the, the annual seminar organized by CIFA in Mombasa and we had the likes of uh, uh, Dr. De De Demo, Demo yeah. talk about it and many other, many of persons. And I started saying, well, maybe you have a point. Then I attended a webinar when you organized jointly with the uh, CC. And uh, there was a very good output again on the same. And of course, recently, when one country decided to make it official currency, now you see you see the future in, in that area. So had I not attended the continuous professional development uh, programs of the Institute, I would have not known that dimension of life. So again, post-qualification, you must stay the course. Just like a doctor reads every time about a new new diseases and how to handle them or a lawyer need, reads about new rulings mm -hmm. so a financial analyst must constantly attend cpds to find new dimensions of investments and wealth creation mm -hmm. so that's what i would say basically mm -hmm. quite a number of things one i jog i might not appear very slim but i jog <laughs> at least twice uh, Twice a, a week, I do four to five kilometers. Wow, of a okay. Run. Uh, more my lawn, so that I like I like greenery and mm -hmm. uh, look after my trees and ensure that I'm in an environment which looks very nice. I like the sound of when you wake up and birds are mm -hmm. singing, mm -hmm. and therefore you must make the environment and the habitat good for the birds. Mm -hmm. And over and above that, I have actually, a, 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 I don't know whether my kids, my friends keep on telling me, why don't you also branch off into that? I like doing things around real estate. Mm -hmm. So, okay. like the current project I'm doing is an old, an old project given, handed over to my wife by the dad. So we are trying to make it modern. Mm -hmm. And therefore, just going to the site and doing some interior designs, bringing down the roof, what, what, those kind of things make me very happy. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, lastly, being around my wife and children, mm -hmm. because that is uh, that's the ultimate mm -hmm. form of comfort when you go back home and you enjoy your stay with your family. Mm -hmm. and that's, that's basically what I can say. Yep. Have, when, you, when, when, when you said I will have to talk about that, I thought about what, what are the two quotes that have kept me going or, or advice. One is, there is a famous preacher, the late uh, Dr. Robert Schuller. Um, he used to have a show called The Hour of Power. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I used to, I'm Catholic myself, but I, I always found myself attracted to one hour. He used to say it's one hour of power. And he used to have this point of advice that find something to do, find someone to love, and above all, love God. And he used to part off by saying that God loves you and so do I. So I think th that package of three, find something to do, find someone to love, and, find, and love God, mm -hmm. have been very strong inspiration. But I also draw to my own experience, uh, 11th, April 2011, when I was graduating with my P 
PhD, mm -hmm. uh, the then vice chancellor of the, the university, uh, Professor Derek Schwartz, mm -hmm. said that education should make you more humble. So the most educated person is the most humble. And, that's, and therefore, when he was graduating us, he was telling us, go into the world with humility as your mantra. And number two, use your education to solve the many poverty problems of the world. I'm not very sure I have solved a lot, but in my small way I've contributed in, to try and see whether, and I think is, when you go back to wealth creation, you'll say that wealth creation is a way of solving the small poverty problem, the big poverty problems of the world in a small way. And therefore I think those who have been my biggest and biggest uh, uh, inspirational quotes for, for, for my personal growth. Ladies and gentlemen, that's it for this episode. We've been looking at real estate investments. Guys, this is a must watch. You need to go back and understand what um, and how to invest in real estate in Kenya. My name is Rina Hicks. I've been hosting David Luigi on this show. It's a fantastic, fantastic episode. And I encourage you to share it and subscribe. There's more content coming for us to learn. How do we grow our wealth? How can we create our wealth so that we retire comfortably? Have a wonderful day or afternoon or morning, wherever you are. And God bless you. Bye-bye.